Darkcast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. Lake Crescent, located in the Olympic National Forest in the northwestern part of Washington State. The lake has a long history of tales and legends, but this true crime story of the beloved Lady of the Lake is a tragic and bizarre case file on the already existing stack. Hallie Illingworth was a waitress working at the Lake Crescent Tavern. She was a Kentucky farm girl looking for a new beginning in the Evergreen State. She had married a man named Montgomery J. Illingworth, known casually as Monty, who was a beer truck driver and known to be a ladies' man. Their marriage was volatile, and just five months in, a fight broke out that was so fierce the police had to be called to break it up. Unfortunately, Hallie went missing shortly before Christmas in 1937, after she didn't show up for work. July 6, 1940, a few fishermen were out on Lake Crescent trying to get a bite from the local fish when they discovered something wild and gruesome. On the surface of the lake near Sledgehammer Point, they found something wrapped in blankets floating on the top of the water. Inside those blankets, they would find the body of a faceless woman that had been hogtied prior to being placed in the blanket. It was unknown how long she had been there, but it was apparent the body itself had undergone a startling transformation. In a bizarre chemical transformation, the flesh had turned into a soap-like substance that could be scooped away like ivory soap. Who was she? And how did this happen? Sup, creeps, and welcome to Creepy Confidential. Is Mothman really a supernatural force predicting impending doom? Did Apollo 11 really land on the moon in 1969? Did you find out if that was a cult that was living just two doors down that you waved to every single day when you got your mail? If these are the things you ponder when you should be sleeping, then I would like to welcome you to Creepy Confidential. I'm your host, Noelle, your resident weirdo Wisconsinite. I open case files on my favorite cryptids, cults, conspiracies, and other worldly creepy with new cases, live broadcasts, and local lore. Some stories have been lost with time. Others are perhaps still happening today in your local communities, right up under your very creepy noses. So get ready, creeps. It's Creepy Confidential. Before we get creeping along today, we have some creeptastic announcements. Creepy Confidential is officially a vendor. Creepy Confidential will be a vendor at GhoulieCon 2024, July 19th and 20th in Covington, Kentucky. We're bringing our merch, stickers and jumbo postcards from our favorite episode art. Plus, we are bringing something very interesting indeed. Items from the rubble of Northern State Hospital. From uh, 1912 to 1973, this was a psychiatric institution. These items are active trigger objects that you can communicate with and see responses on the Spirit Talker. Link for tickets to GhoulieCon in the episode details, as well as our website. We are excited to finally be out in the wild, and we can't wait to bring the Creep Nation to the Ghoulies this year at GhoulieCon 2024. Also, our guest for Creepy Confidential After Dark this month is none other than Bucky Cutright, author of Haunted Cemeteries of Ohio and the awesome tour guide extraordinaire of the Spirited Strolls of Columbus Ghost Tours. Mongers of history, mystery, and legend, it says. Join us June 28th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a creepy good time. No rules, no script, just creepy. Before we begin today's episode, we want to welcome you to the Creepy Confidential Coffee Corner. 
HQ runs on coffee and creepy cases, so we are always brewing a delicious cup of bean juice. Our 2024 June Coffee of the Month is Silver Bridge Coffee. Silver Bridge Coffee Company is truly a homegrown Ohio business. This awesome woman-owned and family-run business has become one of the favorites around these parts, and we have it on stock and ready to go for a late night research session. The founder started roasting beans in their home on a popcorn machine as a hobby, and according to their bio on their website, they would share samples with friends and family in Ohio. So in so many divisions, it's related to Mothman. Now follow. Now they're from Galopolis. I hope I said that correct. <laughs> it's a hop skip and a jump from Point Pleasant. And the company is named Silverbridge. I wonder if they did that intentionally. The, the Silverbridge, right, collapsed in Point Pleasant. And we all know who lives there. Mothman. Today's episode is including a feature for the blend Snow Angel. Caramel, hazelnut, vanilla, and coconut. I enjoy non-flavored coffee usually, but this one had coconut and hazelnut, and I had a delightfully paranormal experience while drinking this. Hot or cold is good. Remember, creeps, our coffees of the month are not sponsored. We believe in shopping here in our cherished USA, and we feel that putting money back in the businesses that help make our daily lives better is important to us. Silverbridgecoffee.com or here in Ohio where we are, I can find it in Kroger, Meyer, and Giant Eagle. It's as if the great Mothman made our dreams come true on that one. Another side note. The first time I spotted Silverbridge and tried it was at Oasis Coffee on the way to Hawking Hills. It's an absolute treasure, this little place off the side of the road. You can have coffee flights. They are outstanding. A little sweet, but oh so fun. The little loft up above when you walk in. Chef's kiss for sitting in there and having a cup of joe. Just another little shout out for a local spot if you're around us. The link to Silver Bridge will be on our socials and sites pinned to the top. Give this one a try, creeps. They ship and they're local to here in Ohio, so absolutely creeptastic. Now, on to the show. Sup, creeps. Today's case file is one that caught my eye when I was the lead as a paranormal investigator. In 2008, I was living in Silverdale, Washington, and our team was researching local haunted locations. The Lady of the Lake is not your run-of-the-mill murder investigation. As the Creep Nation knows by now, when we cover true crime, it has to have a little extra something odd. As the great Mulder once said, let's just say this case has a distinct smell to it, a certain paranormal bouquet. This case checks all the boxes. Murder, deceit, claims of a haunting, and of course, the scientific creepy cherry on the top of this case is the human remains that were discovered years later, completely saponified due to the perfect conditions of the gorgeous surroundings of Lake Crescent. So hold on to your hats because this one is an interesting one. The serene Lake Crescent is located deep in the Olympic Peninsula among the deep green and lush moss surroundings of the Olympic Mountains. It's postcard worthy. It's stunning, I'm telling you. And yet this place when you're there and actually when you're hiking up in that area, I don't know who else might have been out there, but I'm telling you, it also has an eerie and haunting feeling. Um, Like when the sun's behind the clouds, it's chilly, uh, and the misty rain covers everything in this kind of watery blanket. The lake itself has a presence when you approach it. And oddly, it has no smell of of algae like an average lake. Like you walk up to your run-of-the-mill lake, you you can kind of smell it before you're at the, the edge of the lake. When you put your hands in the water, of Lake Crescent, it, it's glacier cold. 
and it is crystal clear, no floaties, nothing. And it almost seems blue. Uh, and this is all caused by a, like, a lack of nitrogen in the water, which inhibits the growth of algae and other bacteria that we usually encounter at a normal lake. Now, remember all that information for what is to come. Now, to this day, the great natives claim that the lake is a living being, and sometimes a malicious one. Local tales state that the Klallam refused to cross the glacier-carved lake by canoe because evil spirits would snatch them to the icy depths. For years, the locals claimed the lake actually had no bottom at all, and some even swore that they spotted sea monsters in the bright blue ripples. A piece of native legend states Lake Crescent was created by the god of Storm King. Angered by the fighting between the Clellum and the Quillyhoot tribes, he hurled a boulder at them, killing the warriors. The lake is said to still hold the spirits of those souls and that the lake will never let them go. Upon this discovery, it is apparent that Lake Crescent has an interesting long history, even before the tragic events of the Lady of the Lake. Hallie Latham Illingworth was born in Kentucky January 8, 1901, to a hard-working farm couple in Greenville, Kentucky. After two failed marriages, she had moved to the Olympic Peninsula about three years earlier. As a young adult, Hallie repeatedly moved west, searching for a better life. She ended up working at the Lake Crescent Tavern, known now as the Lake Crescent Lodge, and is still there to this day, by the way. And this is where she met Montgomery J. Illingworth, known around town as Monty. He was a beer truck driver and a known ladies' man. What I don't understand is what was, what was the appeal, right? Why? Uh, anyway, I just think about that part. You know, like people get in bad relationships. I mean, we've all been in bad relationships. Why? If you know that, stay away. But the two met at the tavern, and he would become her third husband, in hopes that he would be the one. They were married June 16th, 1936, and from the beginning, the two had a volatile relationship. Five months into their marriage, the couple would get into a fight just before dawn that was so fierce that the police had to be called to break it up. Hallie showed up for work at the restaurant with bruises on her face and arms and sometimes even black eyes. Then shortly before Christmas in 1937, she suddenly went missing. She didn't show up for her shift at work and no one heard from her. He had told friends and family that she had run off with another man, but months went by where her family had not heard from her nor seen her. Monty doubled down and stated she was indeed still alive and gave a date of when he had supposedly seen her last. Apparently unbothered by his wife's disappearance, he packed up and moved to Long Beach, California with a woman named Eleanor Pearson, who just happened to be the daughter of a very wealthy timber magnate, which was and is a big business up in that area. He had met her in Port Angeles, and reportedly he was seeing her romantically prior to Hallie's disappearance. With all that, he even filed for divorce, and as if the circumstances weren't suspicious already, he stated incompatibility on the divorce papers, not desertion. Almost three years had gone by when on July 6, 1940, two men were fishing near Sledgehammer Point when they noticed something large and oddly shaped floating on the surface they would find a gruesome discovery. The large floating object was blankets, and inside of those blankets were the remains of a woman. She had been hogtied with heavy rope, and it was apparent she had been strangled. The corpse was wearing a green wool dress, undergarments, and silk stockings. 
The most startling part of this discovery of the woman's body was the actual condition of her body. Her date and time of death was unknown. However, the body had undergone a bizarre transformation. The entirety of her flesh had turned into a soap-like substance that could be literally scooped away like putty. Her body was taken into Port Angeles where a young medical student named Harlan McNutt examined the body. He noted on his exam that the upper part of the face, upper lip, and nose were gone. Her hands had been exposed in the water so the tips of the fingers were gone. There was no way to get fingerprints and no way to tell what this poor woman had originally looked like. The dead woman's flesh had turned to something like ivory soap, McNutt said, later describing a condition known as saponification. The soap-like condition had been a result of the minerals present in Lake Crescent's water and that it had interacted with the fats in the woman's body. The lake's near freezing temperatures had virtually refrigerated the corpse perfectly aside from the parts that were exposed to the air. The visual inspection of the body and a subsequent autopsy showed that the soap lady had met a violent death. Her neck was bruised and discolored and showed evidence of extensive hemorrhage, meaning she had been strangled. Sadly, there was little to try and make identification. However, the body had a distinct upper dental plate. One thing the killer clearly missed, as this would be the clue that led them to said killer. A chart was made of the woman's dental plate and advertised in professional journals. Shockingly, a dentist from South Dakota came forward and was able to identify the Lady of the Lake by the plate he had made for her, and it was indeed the missing Hallie Illingworth. Hollis Fultz, a criminologist from the Washington State Attorney General's office who was helping with the case, suspected Monty of this violent crime, but that it was not premeditated. Hallie and Monty most likely got into a fight at their apartment on that cold December night in 1937. The fight then escalated and it turned violent and Monty brutally beat and strangled Hallie to death. Fultz also believed that Monty tried to conceal what he had done by placing the corpse in the trunk of his car and then drove to Lake Crescent. He then stopped to use some rope from the boathouse and resort so that he could wrap and maybe tie the bundle with said rope. Monty then put Hallie's body into a rowboat, attached weights to the bundle, and rolled out into the deep water. And in she went. The rumor around the water cooler was that Monty did not act alone. However, that was never proven. The law caught up with Monty in Long Beach, California on October 26, 1941, and he was charged with murder. He was brought back to Port Angeles and put on trial. The nine-day trial began February 24, 1942, and was so sensational that it was competing with the news from the front lines of World War II. Monty's defense was that the body of the woman found was not Hallie, and she was still alive and he had seen her on this specific date. Hallie's friends were able to identify items of clothing that were found on the dead woman as Hallie's. Of all this though, the key evidence was the rope. Monty had borrowed 50 feet of rope from a storekeeper at the lake and the store still had remnants of that rope. The fibers were a direct match. After just four hours of deliberation on March 5th, 1942, the jury found him guilty of second degree murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. However, he would only serve nine years when he was paroled and released in 1951. Hallie was originally buried as a Jane Doe at Ocean View Cemetery in Port Angeles, 
and then was moved to her final resting place at Park Hill Cemetery in Vancouver, Washington, January 24, 1942, in an unmarked grave. As for the paranormal investigation that I mentioned that was conducted around Lake Crescent near the lodge, no anomalies were found, no EVPs captured, no spikes in EMF. However, as my fellow investigators know, it could have just been a quiet day. This place had a vibe. I'm not usually the touchy-feely type of investigator, but it did. Overcast, misting, foggy, and the sight of the lodge and the small ramps used for rowboats was eerie. One could imagine the sight of Monty loading the hogtied limp remains into a rowboat and casting off into the foggy night, only to return with an empty boat and some extra rope. Thank you for tuning in for episode 31, Lady of the Lake. If you enjoyed this episode and would like more creepy content, please visit creepyconfidential.com. And closing out our episode today, please enjoy this Dark Cast Network preview presentation by Sinister Story Hour. Stay creepy, my friends. Are you drawn to the dark? Do you find yourself enticed in the forbidden and ominous? Join me, Steph, as I explore all things menacing and malevolent in my podcast, Sinister Story Hour. I discuss true stories of cults and crimes with the occasional urban legend. I also dedicate episodes to missing persons in the United States. And you could be the missing link to provide information and clues that will help to bring them home. Join me every week for a new story. Come on in, sit down, and get ready, because it's story time. <laughs>